So good afternoon. Welcome to the Macmillan Center. I'm Ted Snyder, Dean of the Yale School of Management. Uh, Ian Shapiro, director of the Macmillan Center, uh, re regrets that uh, he's away from Yale this afternoon. Uh, welcome to uh, the Coca-Cola World Fund Lecture at Yale. Uh, this lecture was established in 1992 to support endeavors at the intersection of international relations, international law, and the management of international enterprises and organizations, uh, along with the Macmillan Center, the Yale School of Management, and the Yale Law School join in sponsoring this event. Uh, our featured lecturer was recently named Chief Economic Advisor to the Government of India. Uh, he's one of, of course, the leading uh, experts on the global economy. He's also the Eric J. Gleacher Distinguished Service Professor of Finance at the Booth School of Business at the University of Chicago. In addition, he is a visiting professor for the World Bank, the Federal Reserve Board, and the Swedish Parliamentary Commission. Our speaker's previous experience with the Indian government includes leading a planning commission appointed uh, Committee on Financial Reforms. I recall that the, the Economist magazine, uh, when they reported on the outcome, said simply, uh, Mr. Rajan got it right. Uh, our speaker was formerly uh, the president of the American Finance Association and the chief economist at the International Monetary Fund, the IMF. Um, our speaker's research interests are in banking, corporate finance, and economic development, especially in the role finance plays in it. His papers have been published in all the top economics and finance journals. He served on the editorial boards of the American Economic Review and the Journal of Finance. Um, he was awarded the inaugural uh, Fisher Black Prize in 19, excuse me, 2003 uh, for the top finance economists under the age of 40. It was sort of a hands-down award uh, uh, by uh, his peers. Uh, his book, Fault Lines, uh, How Hidden Structures Still Threaten the World Economy, won the Financial Times Business Book of the Year Award in 2010. Uh, he gives me full credit for that book, by the way. Uh, uh, in my old job, I had asked uh, Raghu Rajan to give a, a talk at graduation, and he's so graceful. He said that that was the in he when he was thinking about how to put put everything going on into perspective that helped him think through uh, the outlines of his book. I'm not sure if that's true, but one of the basic taglines from that uh, book that I think he's promoted is that when you think about financial price crises, you should understand that they originate in, in political crises. Is that a fair, fair insight from, from this wonderful book? Um, I would also recommend uh, his co-authored book with Luigi Zingales entitled Saving Capitalism from the, Cap from the Capitalists. Uh, I can keep going. In 2010, he was featured on Foreign Policy Magazine's list of top global thinkers. In 2011, uh, the Economist poll uh, ranked Raghu Rajan by his peers as the economist with the most important ideas for a post-crisis world. Title that our speaker has chosen for his lecture is, quote, are capitalism and democracy failing us? The challenges facing the post-crisis industrial world. Please join me in welcoming today's featured lecturer, Raghu Rajan. Well, thank you very much for that very kind introduction. And, uh, and uh, um, yes, Ted, you were the inspiration for that book, uh, certainly by asking me to give that talk. And, and, and often, you know, uh, we agree to do things because it forces us to think, uh, which uh, hopefully uh, uh, you will see in this, in this lecture. Uh, I agreed to give this talk because I wanted to think about the links between capitalism and democracy and, and to think about what's, what's happening in the world. Now, 
I haven't gotten uh, as far as, uh, in my thinking as I would like. There are holes, which I'm sure you will be kind enough to point out as we go through this lecture. Uh, but what I want to do is, is, uh, is uh, talk a little bit about uh, what I think happened uh, before the crisis and what's happening after the crisis and why there are serious challenges uh, uh, in front of us today. Let me, let me get into this uh, uh, directly by, by saying what we've seen uh, around the industrial world is basically uh, a bailout following uh, the crisis, a uh, bailout of financial investors, uh, sometimes uh, a bailout of banks, uh, a bailout of governments, uh, and occasionally a bailout of industrial companies. And uh, along with these bailouts, which uh, bailouts uh, don't seem uh, appropriate in a capitalist dog-eat-dog -dog world, right? Uh, the, uh, the weak uh, should essentially, weak organizations uh, should expire while the strong survive. Uh, and you shouldn't have the walking wounded being carried around, at least in the caricature of capitalism, that's how it works. And, and large bailouts uh, are, are not consistent with that. Similarly, uh, what we've seen is a variety of, uh, of uh, authorities uh, that are unelected assuming power. So when we need radical change in, in uh, Greece, we have a technocratic government appointed. When we need radical change in Italy, we have a largely technocratic government appointed. And of course, uh, central banks, by some count, uh, the ECB under Mario Draghi, the Federal Reserve under Ben Bernanke, are helping hold up the world through various forms of quantitative easing. So uh, technocrats, technocratic governments, are displacing elected governments. Uh, and so, you know, given these, uh, you might very well ask the question, is, is capitalism, uh, does it have deep problems? Uh, what about democracy? Does democracy also have deep problems? Uh, and of course, when you couple that with the growing anxiety on the street, uh, anxiety which we've seen result in some uh, sort of street protests in, in Spain, in Greece, and, and the surprise there is that thus far it hasn't been more uh, uh, um, sort of vociferous, uh, louder, but also um, uh, the fear that things can only get worse because we have enormous levels of youth unemployment uh, in this country. We have uh, enormous number of households in deep stress because uh, they're, they're underwater uh, with their houses. Uh, and at the same time, there is a segment of the population in almost every country which uh, uh, looks as if no crisis actually happened, uh, which is earning enormous incomes, uh, which is gaining from the rise in the stock market, and, uh, uh, and seems, seems pretty fine. I mean, uh, Mercedes-Benz and BMW have had their best sales in the last few years uh, post-crisis. Um, so the question really is, uh, are, are we going to see increasing pressures uh, and, uh, and are we going to see a change in system? Uh, and especially because there is a sense across the world that uh, we've moved away from capitalism, uh, but the capitalists are still around. Uh, and it looks as if they've captured policy to bail themselves out. Uh, and one could also ask, uh, given that labor seems increasingly put upon, given that it's powerless, uh, are we going to see a reaction? A reaction because democracy is not giving voice to those people uh, at the bottom. Yes, we've had the Occupy movement. Yes, we've had, uh, we've had protests here and there, but nothing, nothing big, nothing grand, and, and certainly nothing which, uh, which suggests there will be systemic change. So um, what I'm going to argue is, uh, I mean, given this preamble, I'm, I'm going to sort of argue a little bit against it, saying the crisis itself was not caused uh, by elitist or corporatist policies. Uh, it wasn't uh, so much that the regulations were really skewed towards the corporations, but in fact, I would argue that it had some populist underpinnings, uh, an attempt to, uh, to, to spread the gains more widely. Uh, but but I, would I, I will continue to argue that the attempts to spread the gains backfired. 
uh, and backfired uh, because these were short-term attempts, not really well thought out long-term attempts at spreading or sustainable attempts at spreading the gains, which I think there's a, there's a great need of. And, and as a result, uh, what we have is these, uh, these policies backfire, but they backfire by hurting the very people whom they were supposed to help. And so we have this dual economy where the elite across the world are doing very well, while the people who were falling behind and who were ostensibly to be helped by these policies are even worse off <coughs> post-crisis. And they're even worse off partly because many of them are bearing the brunt of the consequences of the debt that was taken on to facilitate these policies, but also because these structural problems that were making them fall behind uh, to begin with are still with us. The fact that there aren't good ways of employment for a certain segment of the population in industrial economies I think is still a very big concern. And so I would argue that going forward we have two problems as a result of the crisis. First, there is this popular perception that the elite have benefited, that capitalism has captured democracy and as a result this is a very unfair system. And, and capitalism can't work in a situation where there is a widespread perception that it favors the few, that mobility is small, et cetera, et cetera. And we'll talk about reasons for that. So we need, to, we need to combat this, not just the perception, but the reality that, in fact, there is uh, a bifurcation of ways in many industrial uh, economies, a way for those who go to elite schools, who come from good families, who have access to wonderful jobs, and a different way for those who've never been to all these places, uh, a way which typically leads down rather than up. So uh, I would argue that to strengthen capitalism and democracy, and, and, and I would argue both, because I think capitalism uh, is stronger when there is a vibrant democracy, and democracy is stronger when there's a vibrant capitalism. I would argue that to strengthen both, we need to restore opportunity to the middle class. And that's something that we had to do before the crisis. It's something that's even more important post-crisis because the, the problems of the middle class have in fact been worsened by the policies that were in place before crisis. And the big question here is, is it possible to do this? Because the fundamental reason for the decline of the middle class is both technological as well as, as the effects of globalization and increased competition. So to some extent, to restore the middle class without dramatic change, changes in social policy might imply uh, a sig significant amount of intervention. And the question is, can you do that intervention while retaining the essential characteristics of capitalism and democracy? And I will leave that as a question. It's something that I haven't been able to think through there are dangers that, in fact, it's not possible. And, and, and you may actually end up uh, with, with something which, which looks very different from where we are now. OK, that's where I'm going. Let me start first with, uh, with sort of what I think are the macro underpinnings of the crisis. I mean, the simple view of the crisis is greedy bankers uh, inflicted pain and suffering on the rest of the world. And I think there is some truth to that but I think it has to be set in a larger context. Why did the bankers suddenly become greedy? Uh, after all, self-interest is at the heart of economics, uh, you know, uh, and, and uh, if we don't have self-interest, we don't get uh, much action. So the, the real question is, uh, what were the circumstances under which credit became uh, sort of uh, unruly and created the problems that we see? And I would argue you have to go back perhaps even to the post-war uh, growth that occurred in industrial countries. It was extremely strong, as you can see from these numbers. Uh, the US grew between 1950 and 1973 at an average of 2.77% a year. Europe grew at 4.77%. What was behind the strong growth? It was, one, the fact that we actually were recovering from both the depression and the war. The war created extreme destruction, so construction in Europe added to the growth. Uh, the fact that the depression led to bad policies, trade-destroying trade, uh, trade uh, policies, also created the conditions for post-war growth. Just restoring trade was uh, very beneficial. In addition to that, 
there were enormous, uh, there's an enormous rollout of technologies. Remember, today we see the internet and we say, wonderful, this is, this, is, this is a great intervention, this has changed our lives. But the lives of our grandparents were perhaps changed even more by the kinds of innovations that happened 40, 50 years ago. Uh, electricity, uh, the motor car, uh, the airplane. And many of these innovations hadn't been rolled out. Certainly they were invented in the early part of the 20th century, but rolling them out across the economy really happened in a big way post-World War. So uh, widespread electrification of Europe, for example, or uh, the rolling out of, uh, of transportation technologies. So there was immense growth from plucking these low-hanging fruits in the, in, the, uh, in the words of Tyler Cohen, uh, an economist from Virginia. And um, in addition to all this, there was education. The increases in education in the industrial world helped also create the growth that, that we saw over this time. So lots of growth seeming never to come to an end, at which point politicians love to spend. And they spent that growth in the 60s. Uh, the welfare state uh, was in many ways created and bolstered. Uh, of course, we got Social Security during the Depression, but the other underpinnings of the welfare state in the United States came with Lyndon Johnson's Great Society. We saw that happening also in Europe in a big way. So promises to pay for people's old age, promises to pay for health care, all these were augmented during uh, the, the 60s and uh, during the period of, of strong growth when it appeared as if it would never come to an end. And it bought labor peace. It bought labor peace. Uh, these were the years of plenty. And then it stopped. In the early 1970s, we had the oil shock. We had productivity uh, falling tremendously. And you can see both in Europe and in the United States, things came down substantially uh, over, this period, uh, over the uh, post-1970s period. I think the two economies had different approaches, different reactions. Uh, I'm going to treat the UK as, as in the same camp as the United States. Uh, what the US and the UK, uh, United Kingdom did in response to the slowdown was essentially deregulation. Whether it's Margaret Thatcher or whether it's Ronald Reagan, it's open up, create growth through greater internal competition, uh, create growth through opening up the economy to external forces. Competition creates, uh, at least for a while, uh, more innovation, uh, more, uh, uh, more efficiencies, and that created growth. Um, and you can see that the US grew faster than Europe over this period through these kinds of, uh, of, uh, of uh, 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 I should say, the, the US uh, fell less than Europe during this period. Um, what continental Europe did was, instead of, uh, instead of uh, you know, uh, doing reforms, uh, opening up the economy to more competition, it focused more on integration. Let's build a bigger Europe, let's build an integrated Europe, and thereby we will get more competition, but we'll also get a bigger market. And within that bigger market, our companies can flourish, become stronger, and that's the way we're gonna grow. And again, that was a different approach that was also initially moderately successful. The problem, however, was each of these approaches created uh, sort of uh, uh, limits. And, 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 and um, in, in the US, uh, the deregulation certainly was very beneficial in terms of increasing growth, but it also, in a sense, skewed the returns from that growth towards the more talented, the more innovative, uh, the more educated. And one way to see this is to see the financial sector in the United States, okay? This is a picture from work by Philippon and Reshev, where what you see is the green line, which is the relative education in the financial sector, okay? And you see the relative education of employees in the financial sector was very high leading up to the 1920s uh, and the great crash in 1929. Post the 1920s, as you get into the 30s and massive amounts of regulation in the financial sector, limiting competition, et cetera, you see the smart and talented leaving the financial sector relative to the rest of the economy. The financial sector essentially goes down in terms of talent, goes down in terms of wages relative to the rest of the economy until the 1980s, when you get the Reagan era deregulation again, and again, people start flocking to the financial sector 
and the, smart, uh, the, the better educated guys go into the financial sector, the relative pay also goes up. That's what I'm, I, I, I'm, uh, uh, I want to highlight, the fact that greater competition, greater innovation also has an effect on the distribution of income, that it is quite possible that it skews the distribution of income towards the more talented, the more capable. And so what problems does that create? Well, it creates the kind of problems that, uh, that we see uh, emerging for the middle class today. So in addition to the deregulation and the competition is the fact that that also creates the space for new technologies to come in. New technologies, it also take, uh, creates the space for global competition to come in. So add global competition, new technologies, on top of the desire to be competitive. And you get the consequences on jobs that are outlined in this particular graph. So think of jobs as divided into skilled jobs and unskilled jobs. Okay, that's the y-axis. And on the x-axis, routine jobs and non-routine non jobs. So what's a skilled routine job? The guy who used to work in insurance companies uh, basically had a high school plus education, had to know how to add and subtract uh, both sides of the balance sheet, had to know what went on this side, what went on the, that side, had you know, pretty good reading skills, et cetera, and basically got a middle class income with good benefits. That guy has been replaced by a machine or a computer long ago. Okay? That job no longer exists. Um, take the other uh, uh, version of routine jobs, routine unskilled jobs, uh, the mechanical work that a textile worker does. Okay? That job has been outsourced long back, uh, first to Japan, then to Korea, then to uh, China, and most recently to Vietnam and Cambodia. Right? So anything that was routine has either been quote unquote globalized, that's a bad word, but you know what I mean, or has been replaced by technology. Okay? That leaves the non-routine jobs, which consist of non-routine skilled jobs, the kind of jobs that many of you will do, will aspire to do at this point, creative jobs. And the non-routine unskilled jobs, basically the work of a gardener, which we can still not substitute with a robot, the work of a hamburger flipper, we can't do that still with a robot. Okay? So we've got this bifurcation. And uh, uh, yesterday I was on a, uh, in a meeting with uh, uh, one of the people there was Mark Andreessen, uh, who is the guy who founded Netscape. Some of you will, never, uh, will not have heard of Netscape. It used to be what existed uh, before Explorer. Uh, Explorer ate its lunch, but Netscape had perhaps the biggest IPO at that time, uh, the equivalent of Google. Mark Andreessen had a very, way, uh, very nice way of putting it. I think he exaggerates. Uh, but he says the world is increasingly being divided into people who tell a computer what to do and people whom the computer tells what to do, <laughs> right? So there are two kinds of people now. And the people who tell the computer what to do are people up there. Actually, I would modify that by say, saying people who tell the computer what to do, software, uh, he's software, he likes to be in that category. Of course, there are people who use the computer to improve their creativity, the people who use uh, computer-aided design, the doctors who use the computer to access large databases which allow them to give a better diagnosis to the, to the individual. So people who use the computer versus people, in a sense, uh, who take instructions. And, and I think what that does is because it bifurcates the economy into high-end jobs and very low-end jobs, but the middle, which used to be that left upper corner, uh, has essentially disappe disappeared. Okay? Um, now, that doesn't necessarily mean we should have income inequality. It doesn't mean we should have income inequality. All it does mean is that in industrial countries, there'll be a lot of jobs at the higher end, and people will aspire to get those jobs, right? And yes, there'll be some lower-end jobs, but if enough people go into the higher-end jobs, it'll raise the wages for lower-end jobs. There's no reason why a gardener who does hard work should be paid less than the consultant, except that we have relatively few people educated to the level that the consultant needs. And, and that's really what's happening in the United States. The supply of skilled people who have the right skills is falling behind the demand for those people. In the, in the words of uh, Claudia Golden and Larry Katz from Harvard, uh, 
in the race between technology and education, education is falling behind. One way to see this is look at male education, uh, uh, male graduation rates from high school or male graduation rates from college. They basically haven't moved much over the last 20, 25 years for the population as a whole. Um, there is a skill mismatch. Even the guys who graduate uh, from college typically tend to take liberal arts courses rather than science, technology, engineering, math, which is primarily where the jobs are. I'm not saying in any way, and don't get me wrong, <laughs> that liberal arts uh, is a bad use of, uh, of, uh, of your college money or whatever. I'm just saying that in terms of where the action is, uh, Mark Andreessen is probably right. There's more action in people telling the computer what to do, and, uh, and therefore science, technology, engineering, math. And of course, if you want to change this, if you want to get more people to be educated to the level that the economy needs, it needs an enormous change, not just in colleges, which are pretty good in the United States, uh, leading the world in, in their quality. It's, it's, it means changing the nature of schools. It means changing the nature of, of families and family experience. Uh, and increasingly, though, what you see in the United States is a bifurcation along every one of these dimensions. Schools, public schools used to be the great equalizer, no longer. Um, uh, Charles Murray has, done, uh, has written a very alarming book, uh, Growing Apart, where he focuses, uh, he sort of abstracts from race by focusing only on white families and looks at the experience of white upper class families versus white lower class families in the United States and sees enormous differences in uh, everything ranging from incomes uh, to lifestyles to uh, you know, divorce rates uh, to, in fact, according to uh, uh, an article in the New York Times the other day, uh, even life expectancy. And that is really alarming that uh, there is a bifurcation going on in the United States between the top end and the lower end. Another way of saying, seeing this is th the, are these graphs by David Otor uh, from MIT, where he shows that uh, over time, uh, look at the left graph, uh, uh, C skills arranged in increasing order of skill on the x-axis. And what you see is in between 1979 and 89, uh, what happened was the higher skilled jobs got more people in them. Okay, so that's what that graph says more jobs for the higher skilled uh, uh, jobs, uh, fewer jobs being created in the lower skilled. And then what you see is since then, you see something which looks more like a U shape when you aggregate these numbers. That is, there are more jobs being created at the lower end and more jobs being created at the upper end, and the middle is shrinking considerably. Again, a reflection of that earlier graph that I put out. And uh, you can see that also reflected uh, in, in, in wages, the middle uh, wages are coming down, wages at both other extremes are going up. And, and uh, finally, this is a third way of showing the same thing. Uh, what you see in the dark line here is the 1950 log hourly wage differential. The wage difference within the 90th percentile of the income distribution, which is somebody who has a college degree, and the 50th percentile of the wage distribution, which is typically a high school graduate who's a factory worker, you see that has been increasing considerably. Even though the difference between the 10th and the 50th percentile between a farm worker and the factory worker is actually narrowing. So in a sense, the middle is getting squeezed out. Wages at the bottom are increasing somewhat. Wages at the top are increasing a lot. The middle is actually falling and falling out. Now, one should, uh, there's not, everything is not bleak in what has been happening. There are actually some, some, some points of light. One, for example, is the new elite, the guys at the upper end, are the educated elite, right? They're there because they got a stronger education. They're not there because they're suddenly of family wealth. So if you look, for example, at, at CEOs, uh, CEOs increasingly come from outside the Ivy League. Not good news for you guys, <laughs> but, but they do increasingly come from outside the Ivy Leagues. Uh, they increasingly are more educated uh, but the background uh, is, uh, is, not, uh, is not as elite as it was. However, to some extent, the CEOs reflect what happened in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, right? When, when things were much better. Since then, things are getting more skewed, and today it's increasingly likely uh, 
that the children of the rich are much more likely to complete college than the children of the poor, and that difference has been increasing. In other words, even though we are seeing at the top levels the effects of the egalitarian education that prevailed in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, going forward, we are increasingly going to see the bifurcation. And we'll have a new elite, but the new elite will be composed of guys who went to college and their children, uh, and, the, uh, and, and the new underclass will be those who never had a chance. OK, so why is any of this interesting? It's interesting because I think it affects the policies that got us into trouble, and going forward, it will affect the nature of democracy. So first, in terms of policies, well, if you had this kind of bifurcation, people falling behind, and it's been happening for 25 years, there is immense pressure on politicians to do something. Okay? And I would argue that the rising inequality and the political pressure to do something had two consequences. One is everybody started talking about education. Since Gerald Ford, every president has been the education president. But of course, it's very hard to do something about education when, in fact, there are deep underpinnings across the board that drive it. So if you can't tackle that, and if your horizon is relatively short term as a politician, perhaps you might come to the conclusion that since I can't actually fix their incomes, is there any way that I can make them happier, better off? Because democracy has uh, these populist pressures also. And if you figure out that people care about consumption, uh, why not provide them consumption? And the easiest way to provide them consumption, especially when you have limits on doing welfare, remember America is also going through the Reagan-Clinton era at this point, is credit. If you can give cheap credit and people can go out and use that credit to consume, especially if they don't think that using that credit they're going more into debt, well, that's basically uh, 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 something which can make them happy. It's something that can make the bankers happy. It's something that the politicians love. Nobody is made worse off at least in the short run, through credit. So I would argue that, that if you look at the consumption boom that we had through the 2000s, it was fueled by a variety of policy measures as well as a, a, a variety of private sector measures. But the bottom line is, given the pressures on the politicians, there was absolutely no incentive to stand in the way. Any regulator who tried to do something about it was quickly reined back because there was immense pressure for this credit to go on. And of course, there were large-scale programs. Uh, in the Clinton administration, this was the attempt to get affordable housing uh, to broad segments of the population. Uh, and there were measures taken. We can discuss those. Uh, in the Bush administration, it was a continuation of the same policies, but with the idea that by doing so, you would create an ownership society, create people who owned homes, and therefore had an interest in the future, even though you know, from an income perspective, it didn't look as good. And of course, uh, one could argue about the extent to which these were used, but instruments that the government had, the FHA, Fannie, Freddie, uh, coupled with the willingness of the private sector to sort of jump on for the ride, and you had a massive credit boom. So I am arguing is that the fundamental sort of sources of the credit boom in many ways are rising inequality and immense pressure to do something about it pressure to do something about it in the short run rather than the long run. And that typically led to much more accommodative government policies, both on the regulatory front as well as the fiscal and monetary front, which led to the kind of boom that we had and eventually the day of reckoning, the bust that we see. And, and what you can see, just bolstering my point, is that even though income inequality rose over this period, that is the da dashed line, consumption inequality <laughs> did not. Uh, it was much flatter. And some work by colleagues at the University of Chicago basically show, if you look across the United States, across the areas of the United States, in areas with greater income inequality of this period, you had much more spending by lower income people in an attempt to keep up. And in fact, they went into greater debt, and now those areas have greater distress. So the link I'm trying to draw is between the financial sector and the real economy, the political pressures to do something in a democracy. Very natural pressures, very important pressures, but unfortunately pressures which result in short-term outcomes which could be detrimental in the long run. The same guys who went out and borrowed against the house as an ATM when the price was going up, 
are also people who are deeply underwater today because not only have they lost their jobs in those areas, but also their houses are now worth 30, 40% less than when they bought them. So um, I would argue that, that the policies engendered by this inequality were problematic. So was deregulation a failure uh, in, the, in the UK, in the, in the United States? I would argue no. It helped the household as a consumer. And one of the important effects, for example, is Walmart. Uh, Walmart has brought down the price of the consumption ba basket, especially for lower income people, tremendously. And Walmart, of course, uses technology and, and, and globalization as much as any other uh, uh, entity in the world. So deregulation could have worked if it had been accompanied by the, the things that the government needs to do, which is skill building uh, in a way that would keep uh, the incomes of, of households strong. Uh, financial, uh, financial deregulation also was not a bad thing. It helped innovation, but the financial sector went off track. So in, in broadly, what I'm arguing is we didn't have a failure of capitalism, but we had a failure to support the things that capitalism needs, that is reasonable regulation, but also a nurturing of the skill base of the economy so it can take advantage of the benefits of capitalism. So th what we're left with is, can we harness finance but also, can we do something to bring the people who are falling behind back into the economy in a reasonable way, uh, a way that, that gives them a chance to, to compete and earn decent incomes? And I'll come back to that in just a second. Let me, for a brief minute, talk about how the euro area responded. The euro area didn't deregulate as sharply and as quickly as, as the United States. Uh, they were much more willing to protect industry, to protect uh, labor, but what they did instead was integrated, so that that created competition between uh, sort of national champions. Um, and um, the, the problem, however, was that there were limits to the benefits of this integration without the deeper underlying labor market reform, uh, making it easier to hire and fire workers and so on, which the United States and the United Kingdom had. And so what you had in these economies were what are called insider-outsider economies. Economies where if you had a job, it was great because you got a wonderful salary, you could rarely be fired, uh, and you really had to do something terrible to get fired in these places. So the insiders had it really good. But if you were a young person on the outside who still hadn't got a job, it was terrible because you were large, likely to be unemployed, uh, and you were unlikely to get one of those cushy jobs until some guy who already had it retired. In the meantime, you probably worked in temporary jobs, uh, and, and not really anything with any decent benefits. Now, what happened in the Euro area is once they saw the limits of that kind of integration, they decided to go even further. And this was the move to the Euro, which was a common currency. And the idea was with a common currency, we'll get even stronger competition. We'll get even more of the benefits of integration. They got that, but they also got a common sort of uh, economic area with a common interest rate and a common currency. And because the interest rate that they got in that area was in some cases too low, given the nature of the economy, it was common interest rate, given the state of the economy, given the conditions of the economy, what it resulted in was debt fueled spending booms across the periphery of, uh, of Europe. You had a housing boom in Spain, you had local government boom in spending in Spain, airports, uh, ports being created, uh, theaters, uh, magnificent structures that now lay, lie empty because they spent too much. In Greece, uh, the size of the government increased 20% after Euro accession. Uh, somebody was telling me about a visit to Greece where you know, originally they had to go through two offices to get to the prime minister's office. Now you have to get through seven offices because those seven offices are manned by hanger-ons who really don't have much to do, so they have an office and they interrupt your progress to the prime minister, but, uh, but, but you have to spend time on the way. So lots of, uh, of inefficiencies uh, generated, but supported by the ability to issue debt. And of course, this party went on until it became impossible to issue more debt, and that's where uh, much of, of peripheral Europe is. But 
they're there with an additional complication. In the same way as uh, US households ended with a huge amount of debt, these guys have a double problem. Not only have they ended up with a huge amount of debt borrowed during the go-go years, but they also have economies which are terribly uncompetitive. Because in the go-go years, the spending went uh, without thought for productivity and com competitiveness, especially because the areas where the spending was most extreme, government spending as well as in the construction sector, aren't sectors that are subject to a lot of competition. So you could increase wages, uh, you could increase them substantially without much thought for productivity. Now that nobody's willing to finance them, they find that in fact they are highly uncompetitive and they have to adjust. And so that's where we are. We are in a situation where the countries that <coughs> liberalized, that deregulated, have one kind of problem, which is uh, extreme levels of inequality, uh, uh, sort of coupled with the, with the effects of the housing bust still in the United States. The countries that <coughs> did uh, integrate but didn't deregulate as much, a number of those countries are laboring under deep problems of uncompetitiveness where they have to get back on track and become more competitive. And in the meantime, both sets of countries have increased borrowing tremendously and are weighed down by tremendous amounts of debt. Um, and in terms of Europe, again, the policies of allowing more borrowing by the governments, by the local governments, by the banks, and by the households has again ended in tears. Europe started, the periphery countries, Greece, Italy, and Spain, started the accession to the euro in 1999 with high levels of unemployment. In 2007, before the crisis, brought down the levels of unemployment tremendously. In 2010, they're back to where they were. In fact, they're a little worse off. And of course, now there's the threat of government collapse, et cetera. So to answer the question I started with, has capitalism subverted democracy? I would say uh, it has to be looked at in a, in a more nuanced way. Democracy created pressure to keep growing. And the growth, uh, the attempt to grow faster than was sustainable uh, was, was made possible through populist policies easy credit, government spending. Private financials were not uh, blameless in this process. They jumped on for the ride and essentially may have written the, uh, the process too long. Uh, there was a convergence between business and politics here. But to argue that the crisis is a consequence of elitist policies in the first place, I think is to misread what happened. Uh, that it was actually in some ways a response to broader uh, needs and those needs are still unmet. Uh, whether it be in the underclass in Europe or the underclass in the, in the US. Um, uh, this is uh, 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 sort of just an argument saying even the bailouts, uh, I would argue that bailouts weren't necessarily uh, uh, meant to just bail out the elite, though when you look at them, uh, they do seem that way. Saving the banking system was important for the United States. If you had let the banking system go, it could have been disastrous. Now, could the bank bailouts have been done in a better way, imposing more pain on the bankers, imposing more pain on the shareholders and the bondholders? Of course. Uh, with hindsight, uh, even with foresight, it could have been done much better. But was the essential scheme of saving the banks important? Yes, because otherwise, what would have been a great recession could well have been converted into a great depression. Um, I would argue that the kid gloves with which the financial sector was treated was primarily because of cognitive capture rather than because of crony capitalism. It, it wasn't necessarily uh, because the people in power in Washington wanted a job in Goldman Sachs after they retired or had a job in Goldman Sachs and, uh, and, and, and loved the, the, the amounts they had made and loved their friends there. I would argue it's more that they talked too much to people at Goldman Sachs while they were devising the rescues, that they saw things from the perspective of the big banks on Wall Street and didn't think about the alternatives or had gotten accustomed to the view that bailing these banks in the, most, uh, in the quickest way possible is the way to a full-fledged rescue uh, and, and perhaps could have thought a little differently. But um, I would argue, therefore, that those bailouts aren't necessarily uh, a, a evidence that we have got a lot of crony capitalism. There is crony capitalism in every country. Uh, there is crony capitalism in the United States. 
But whether it's increased tremendously in recent years, I think one could debate. We have large deficits, not because the banks were bailed out. That is a small part of what is happening. We have large deficits because revenues are lower, because spending has increased, including on automatic stabilizers, but also on the stimulus. So, so I would argue that's not a reason to say the capitalists have tremendous influence. And more generally, if you step back and think about the democratic process, you have to believe the democratic process is more vibrant today than it used to be in the past. Anybody who has access to the internet can start a blog. In fact, my son has a blog and uh, writes repeatedly about how he uh, dislikes uh, various candidates. I won't say which side he favors. Uh, but, uh, uh, but the point here is that anybody can write. You can have access to public influence very easily. So yes, Citizens United gave a lot of power to the corporations, to the unions. But to some extent, that power has been balanced by competition between the large organizations. Last I saw, President Obama is generating more from these uh, super PACs uh, than, uh, than, pre than candidate uh, Romney. And uh, one could debate who has the edge going forward. So I would argue that, that really it has strengthened our democracy to have much more dissemination, much greater sources of uh, information. So, before you accuse me of, of being Panglossian, be before you accuse me of saying everything is fine, I would say there are still deep problems. And those deep problems stem from what was unresolved before the crisis, this growing divide. If there is a growing divide, and the majority is falling below, and that majority doesn't see the opportunity or the gains from an integrated global economy with tremendous improvements in technology, at some point, that, in, that population falling behind will start protesting. Okay? When and if they start storming the barricades, I don't know. But it seems to me untenable that any uh, democratic society can maintain high levels of inequality without the pushback eventually coming. Because eventually, the social contract starts breaking down. Eventually, the capitalists get delegitimized. How come you're there while I'm here, and how come I have no chance of getting there? The capitalist system is supposed to provide you a ladder to get there. Uh, that becomes delegitimized. But I think uh, equally problematic, democracy itself starts coming under strain. When the big capitalists, uh, the owners of money power, so to speak, uh, basically get delegitimized, then they have no independent influence on government. I mean, take Putin's Russia. If you're an oligarch and you stand up against government, you get put in jail for a long, long time. At least that's the caricature of what happens. There's probably some truth to it. So which oligarch stays in Russia and stands up against the government other than you know, as a put-up candidate by the government? Very few. So in that kind of world, there is no check or balance against the government because large concentrations of power outside the government have essentially been delegitimized and become dependent on the government for their continued wealth. On the other hand, in the United States, you have somebody like Sheldon Adelson, Adelson uh, who is willing to run full-page full ads against the government. Uh, I'm not uh, going to take a stand on whether he's right or wrong. Only the fact that he exists is something that is uh, a, a testament uh, to the possibilities in this country of people with lots of uh, money standing outside the government and not kowtowing to the government. And that creates, that helps, I think, foster uh, a stronger democracy because it is one additional uh, constraint on arbitrary government. So my sense is if this uh, increasing inequality uh, persists, we are going to get a delegitimization of both the capitalists as well as democracy and it'll be to the detriment of both. So we do need to restore opportunity and hope to the middle class. And I think uh, uh, clearly we have to focus on education and skills. Clearly we have to improve innovation. These are hard. These are hard, but there is no shortcut to this. I think we have to work very hard to do this. And importantly, this will require some resources. Clearly we can spend better, but it will also require some resources. And the key question here is, how do you get the working rich? The guys who made the money on their own, or presumably uh, they see it as their own, to pony up for the kinds of changes that need to take place. And at the same time, how do you keep the policies of the government from getting overly uh, focused 
on taxation and redistribution to the detriment of innovation. We need a balance between both sides. And that's the difficult challenge uh, going forward. And of course, there are also immense short-term problems. How do you get the unemployed, especially the youth, into the labor force? Uh, what kinds of ways do we have of getting, not you guys, I'm sure many, uh, most of you or all of you will get wonderful jobs when you leave. It's the guy in the ghetto uh, who's, who's been condemned to live there. How do you get him into a functioning job? Uh, those are, uh, are important, uh, uh, important questions we need to ask. Uh, how, do you, how do you talk to a 57-year-old GM worker who's been laid off three years ago? and has been looking for a job in the auto industry but has no hope of getting it because his skills are way outdated. Uh, what do we do for those guys who are not too old to retire, uh, uh, not, uh, not, not too old to retire but not too uh, um, young to retrain themselves? Uh, how do you engage the unemployable, the guys who don't have the skills to cut it? Uh, because there will be some of them and uh, how do you engage them? And how do you do this in Europe? where the government is increasingly hamstrung uh, by high levels of, of debt. So that's where I want to end. Our, our, our problems are not elite capture, at least not any more than in the past. I'm not saying there is no crony capitalism. I'm not saying that policies aren't structured to benefit uh, the, the incumbents in the industry. There's always uh, some of that. I'm just saying that what we've seen in the recent past that led up to the crisis was not that. Uh, I think more of it was populist policies across the industrial world, populist policies which had democratic roots and were important to assuage pain. Unfortunately, they have failed. And with the electorates impatient as well as divided, I mean, we talk about polarization amongst politicians in the United States, and that's very real, even according to measures developed by political scientists. But that polarization reflects the polarization of the electorate. And so it is very difficult for politicians to break from their natural constituencies and bridge the gap between them and other politicians. So uh, we had short-term policies which have made things worse. Uh, and, and if we extend that to blame the capitalists, uh, we could reduce an important check on arbitrary government. What we need is to work together in some sense to restore uh, opportunity to the middle class. Now, the, the bleak vision of the future is it's impossible. The bleak vision of the future is technology has totally displaced the middle class or globalization will displace whatever remaining jobs there are in the middle class and all that will be left is a few people at the top and lots of people at the bottom through technology, through globalization. That's a bleak vision of the future. The more pleasant vision of the future is we will get back to a more reasonable income distribution, not through massive government intervention, limiting competition, limiting outside uh, entry, and limiting the growth of technologies, but by improving people's endowments, by improving the quality of education, by improving capabilities, and tying education and capabilities more to the kinds of jobs that are being produced by the economy. If we go that route, we can still have a vibrant capitalism but also an extremely vibrant democracy with all the tools, the social media, et cetera, that we have. So those are the two alternate, alternative visions. Of course, there are many more in between. So let me stop there and uh, give you a chance to ask a few questions.